Okay, so this is going to be the last segment of our, um, as far as my lecture, we might have a couple videos, is um, we're going to be talking about attack and escape behaviors, which basically we're talking about anger and fear. So, um, attack behaviors are associated, the main thing that I want you to know off this slide is attack behaviors are associated with increased activity in the corticomedial uh, area of the amygdala. So let's highlight that. Okay, so we're going to look at the corticomedial area of the amygdala. So this is your, um, this is the area where you're going to feel a lot of anger. This is going to be the an attack. Um, after we experience um, someone's provoked us, this area of the amygdala, it stays up. Like, I remember, um, I'm not sure if you remember the astronaut, the, the famous astronaut case where the woman got very upset because her lover was seeing someone else. And then I believe she drove from Texas to Florida. And the funny thing that people would laugh about is that she wore diapers so she wouldn't have, all she had to do was stop for gas, that she wouldn't have to stop to go to the restroom. Um, and we would always argue in our class about that case because I was trying to tell them, I said, well, that's the, the snapped thing. That's the, the cortex shutting down because her amygdala was so wrung up from, you know, this jealous rage that she was having. And, um, but my students would always argue with me and they'd say, no, Amy, because she drove all the way from Texas to Florida, that's premeditated, you know, because I was saying, I, th I believe she snapped. I mean, look, she's an astronaut. She, she, she ha doesn't have any prior history of crime. You know, this was the same snapped. And what they couldn't understand was that when your amygdala gets up there, when it starts becoming activated, that can be triggered by the stimuli, but then you can think about it, think about it, think about it, and it can maintain that up there. And so it, the temporary insanity a lot of times won't just last for a few minutes. It can last for hours, days, because you keep thinking about it, thinking about it, and then it stays up there. It says, after experiencing a provocation, people are more likely to attack for a period of time afterwards. So basically, you know, there's I teach a class called Group Dynamics. You have it at your college. And what they're kind of trying to learn in that class is um, emotional intelligence. And one thing that we discuss in that class is, when do you face conflict and when do you walk away from conflict? And that's something that I really want you to understand out of this class. A lot of times in this class we're teaching just technical stuff. But if you really look at it on a deep level, the understanding of the brain can help you in so many aspects of life. Understanding that, you know what, there's times when you need to just walk away from a conflict because when their amygdala is fired up so hardcore, they can't think, they can't reason. They can't, log they can't be logical. So why are you going to waste your breath on trying to talk to somebody that simply their cortex is shut down? They can't think. They cannot. So it's better to just, okay, this is not a good time to have this conflict. And you need to wait a long time. You know, that's another thing. People don't get over being angry very quickly. That's, that's another thing that I see in my classes a lot. In the group, in the group class, they talk about, well, I told the person that I was sorry, and they can't understand that you can't just snap out of that in like five minutes. Once this is up there, it's up there. And, you know, when you say you're sorry, the person's still going to be mad for a while. It's going to take like a long time for that amygdala to come down. So these are some things to understand about emotional behaviors. Is one, when, when their amygdala fires, heavily, it's probably not the best time to try to have a conversation. Um, you need to let time pass. And then another thing is, is don't expect when you say you're sorry, when someone's angry, when you say you're sorry and you explain your case, don't expect them to just flip over. Oh, I understand. It's it's not going to happen. That's not the way the amygdala is set up. Okay. Um, an initial attack behavior increases the probability of a second attack. So I'm just saying like you fight. And then you say, well, I don't want to talk about it anymore, but then you go back, it's going to happen again. And, you know, this is something is basically what they found about married couples is that, you know, it's what, what, whether or not you're going to make it in a marriage or not is, is the way you fight. 
the way you handle conflict, that's a big predictor of whether or not you're going to get a divorce or not. So it's really helpful for you to understand how this works. And men especially, even more than women, they become flooded with emotion when they get um, attacked. And so women, you kind of need to understand that because we don't become as flooded. We can we can talk things out more when we're disagreeing. But men, when you disagree with them, it's like an attack on them and their amygdala becomes very... Uh, this is not all men, so please, I'm, I'm stereotyping right now. Um, so when their amygdala becomes activated, probably it's best if you just let things lie low instead of just continuing to go back. And, and men, a lot of times, what they do is they withdraw. They feel this. They don't want to attack their mate because they know they love their mate, but they feel this uh, inside of them. And so what they do is they isolate themselves. But women, they're not as flooded, and so they want to wait, you can't just leave me. We're having an argument. I need to get this resolved. So ladies, you kind of need to understand that he needs to back up off of you until his amygdala can calm down. It's best to probably give him a space. Okay, so here I'm just showing you the corticomedial nucleus right here. This is your anchor. Um, environmental factors, uh, it, associated with increased violent tendencies include exposure to lead. So some people are more violent than others. I think a lot of you know that. Um, these are some biological aspects that you might want to be aware of. Exposure to lead, smoking behavior of a mother during pregnancy. Um, the textbook is going to talk about uh, the crime rates, uh, incarceration rates, if the mother smoked during pregnancy, which, which is kind of an interesting correlation there. The effect is particularly strong if the mother smoked and had complications during pregnancy. So they think for whatever reason the smoking may rewire the brain. But again, this is a correlational research. So it could have been that the type of mother that would smoke during pregnancy um, could also have had the genes to make for more violence. We don't know exactly, but it, I thought it was interesting information that you might want to check out in your textbook. Um, twin studies suggest a genetic contribution. Okay, so if one twin is violent, the other twin has a higher probability of being violent. As you can see, monozygotic twins, so that's um, identical twins. They resembled each other with, with, um, with regard to their violent tendencies much more than dizygotic twins, which are fraternal twins. Um, so that's both in violent behavior and criminal behavior. However, they can't find a specific gene. So let's just review what you should know off the slide. Again, I don't want to go too fast. I don't want you to get hand cramps. So please learn to just take the basic point notes. So let's get some basic point notes off the slide. Okay. For aggression and attack behaviors, aggression, well, that's what we're basically talking about right here, is they have found some evidence for a genetic contribution because they have found that identical twins are more similar in their violent tendencies and their criminal behaviors than um, non-identical twins, fraternal twins, but they can't find a specific gene. Okay, There's a genetic contribution as evidenced by twins, but they have a difficulty finding a specific gene. 